I'm happy to introduce our presenter, Dr. Sampur Narappa. She is scientific writing tutor at the medical library. She is a medical writer, a referencing and fact-checking expert and medical editor, and has therefore profound experiences in teaching of various scientific writing courses and scientific editing. Further, she holds a PhD in cancer biology. She will present you a hot topic, the risk of using ChatGPT to co-write your scientific paper. Good afternoon, everyone. Thank you, Michelle, for setting the stage for us and for moderating today's session. And thank you, everyone, for joining me today for this brief, but I hope a useful summation of the risks in using ChatGPT as a collaborator for writing scientific papers. Uh, I'm Sampurna, and as Michelle said, I'm an academic writing tutor here at the University of Bern Medical Library, and I work as part of the Research Support Services team. And my goal today is to inform you of what ChatGPT can and cannot do, and what you need to know if you plan on using it for your research or writing projects. Basically, I want us as a community of scientific writers to go from being wide-eyed, excited users, you know, the type we see in unboxing videos on YouTube, to becoming informed, intelligent, and cautious users of a very powerful tech tool. ChatGPT is a conversational AI tool. It is the chatbot variant of the GPT large language models. A large language model is a fancy way of saying it's a computer program that uses a bunch of algorithms that have been fed a large data set, which lets them model, that is process, understand, and generate a human language. And these algorithms form a network and that are layered and so, sort of resembling how neurons are connected in our brain, which is why you'll hear the term deep neural network being used when talking about chat GPT or GPT. Uh, GPT itself stands for Generative Pre-Trained Transformer. Generative because it generates text and not just copy pastes it. And pre-trained because the algorithms have been trained on billions of pieces of openly accessible text to figure out how humans use language. And Transformer is the name of the revolutionary deep neural network model that's behind ChatGPT's astonishing ability to sound human-like. The transformer network is great at figuring out the context surrounding the words. And so that's why ChatGPT is able to give you a coherent paragraph that kind of looks like a human wrote it. Uh, the free public version was released in November 2022. And currently, the free version uses the GPT model 3.5. And the paid version, ChatGPT Plus, uses the GPT model 4.0. So what's gone into it? Um, unfortunately, OpenAI is no longer open. It used to be open source code until GPT-2, and we know a bit about what went into GPT-2, but Microsoft bought exclusive license to GPT-3 in 2020. And so now the company guards its secrets. The algorithms can't be seen. They're black boxed. Training sets can't, can't be inquired, and validation cannot be independently verified. What we do know is that the training data set was last updated in 2021, and it includes open access text that's available on the internet. It's not a knowledge repository or a, by default a search engine. Um, and so in real time, it does not have access to PubMed, Embase, Cochrane, any of the medical information library uh, databases that we use. And how do you use it? Um, you create an account on chatgpt.openai.com using your email address, and then you log in, you see an interface, and there you type in a question or a request. And this is called a prompt. There's an art to writing prompts. You're essentially digging information out of a static database. So there are strategies to get the best out of the model. And this is turning into a new skill set called prompt engineering. To do this well, you need to know your subject matter. And at present, at least in science and medicine, you need to be already well informed, if not an expert, to give the right prompts, the right directions to the model, and then, of course, have the knowledge to check if the responses meet high quality standards. So you can also tell this is uh, open AI whether you like the output and give it feedback. And this is very important to the companies because they are essentially doing a free product testing. So they use your feedback to improve their product. So what does it produce? Mostly generic, coherent, grammatically correct text, but there is no insight, no original thought. And when you push it, when you make the prompts tougher, more specific, more nuanced, it starts to hallucinate, which is an AI scientist's term for it makes stuff up. So when you start pushing it for reformulation, it'll shuffle words around, sort of like a math-powered phrase salad mixer, 
And it's also a people pleaser, so it'll always want to tell you something than nothing. So it uses its correlation statistics and it puts words together that statistically make sense, but logically or factually may not make sense. So when you experiment with ChatGPT, and I encourage you to do so, you will notice that it will make stuff up, it will make up references especially, and this is very true for the free version of ChatGPT. First thing you need to know, when you share anything with ChatGPT, your data is not secure. So here are the screenshots from when I created my ChatGPT account in March. And OpenAI clearly says that the conversations are reviewed to improve their systems, and they explicitly mention not to share any sensitive information. Um, they say that this is a free research preview, and their goal is to get feedback, and they also say, yeah, we are not going to tell you. Uh, we may at occasionally gen uh, give you incorrect or misleading information, right? Okay, so now let's look at some use cases of ChatGPT in scientific writing. And for this, I've used the paid version of ChatGPT, ChatGPT Plus. It costs about 20 francs a month. Uh, and it promises to be 40% more likely to produce factual information and lets you work with longer text. So I figured that if ChatGPT4 or ChatGPT Plus is not going to do the job, then the free version is definitely not going to work out, right? So I started where we all start, not with dumping words on a page, but looking for information, kind to grow our background knowledge. So can ChatGPT use for, can, can it be used for literature searching? And I asked it the query, I said, you are a medical information specialist, so use reliable sources and summarize the use of cannabis in managing side effects related to chemotherapy. And in a matter of seconds, it spat out all of this text. Don't bother reading it. You can look at it later. Uh, and at first, actually, it looks impressive, right? The, it, there are four bullet points. There's even a disclaimer at the end. And it's impressive. It takes just a matter of seconds. But then when I dug deeper, I found that a couple of these points did not contain references, and one point looked entirely speculative. So then I asked it again, please provide references for this, you know, the information that's in the summary. And again, it listed four references, um, looked impressive. Uh, it has ASCO and NCCN guidelines in there, guidelines that I would use. Uh, when coming up with this information. Um, and all of these URLs work, which is not the case for the free version. Um, so that's looked kind of impressive. And then I dug in um, a little deeper and I found that it had the summary had actually misrepresented the guidelines presented in the first two references. References three and four are not even cited in the summary. Um, and when I dug into the content of these references, they actually contradict what the summary is uh, saying. There is a citation in the summary that is completely hallucinated. I could not find it anywhere. All the sources are US centric. I don't know if that's a bias in the data set, but maybe you need to push the system to give you information that is more relevant to the European context. And if I did it the old fashioned way, if I just went into medical information databases and tried to answer this question, the re recent evidence actually contradicts what the summary tells me. So can ChatGPT be used for literature search? I don't think so. Uh, the text it comes up with has factual errors, sources are not up to date, and it's not an efficient process, right? It takes a lot of time to fact check. Um, my advice is to interact with your literature, understand the discourse, understand the context within which you're working, evaluate the knowledge gap, develop your arguments. All of this is going to help you when you write the narrative sections of your paper, which is the introduction and discussion. And also, once you start to know your literature and the people are working in your field, when you're out in conferences, you can start actually talking about the work that they do in a meaningful way and end up actually creating collaborations that are helpful for your research. So think beyond publishing. So let's say you've done the hard work, you know your literature, and you have written up something, but you want to use ChatGPT to revise a draft. And for this, um, I used a published paper, which had a bunch of problems in, this, in its introduction. So I told ChatGPT, you're an expert scientific writer and editor. Here's the style guide. This is what I need you to do. Uh, please revise it. And I stuck in the introduction, introductory text. And this is what it came up with. Um, it looks better. It's shorter. There are more paragraphs on surface. It looks fine, right? But then when I dig into it, I find that the ChatGPT Plus version is still difficult to read. And that's because the hard to read and very hard to read sentences, the proportion of those have not changed by much. So this is uh, th this analysis I did using Hemingway Editor, which is available online for free. Um, and so it basically says they both have poor readability scores, okay? And 
if you look, I, I use another system to look at this and you find that at the sentence level, when it's compressing the text, it's actually creating certain words and introducing words that reduce readability, reduce understanding. Um, and specifically, what it also doesn't understand is that we use inclusive language when we write. So using some, saying something like autistic children or autistic subjects is not okay. You would, you would prefer to write participant with autism. Um, and it uses three different ways uh, to talk about the same thing. Uh, we should aim for consistent terminology when we write. So can ChatGPT be used to revise a draft? Yes, for cosmetic changes, but not for really the important bigger issues. Like does your writing have a focus point of view? Are the paragraphs logically organized? How is the structure how, and, and how are they structured? And are, is the terminology consistent, concrete, and inclusive? And all of this you learn as you write, you get better at it. So first time writers will need to be trained in scientific writing to be able to judge the output. And experienced writers will need to first learn how to code chat GPT. And then in any case, everybody will need to edit the work that it produces. If you do use ChatGPT and you think it's made a substantial contribution to your paper, should you list it as an author? The unequivocal answer is no. ChatGPT cannot fulfill all the authorship criteria listed in the ICMJE recommendations. The uh, statements put out by the World Association of Medical Editors and the Committee on Publication Ethics say specify that human author is accountable and responsible for all content in the paper. An AI tool does not understand conflict of interest or copyright or licensing, so it cannot sign the documents that you would need to provide at the point of submission. And I advise you to go to your target journal's publisher's website and look for guidelines on the use of generative AI tools. Publishers have varying tolerance for the use of these tools and have slightly different requirements. So do look those up early in your writing process. In any case, what will help you in general is to have a disclosure mindset when using AI tools. Okay, so you should know who used them, the time and date of use, the prompts, what sections contain the text and the ideas in the paper um, that are generated by the tool. Um, and this you will need to include as part of the manuscript, right? And that's because AI detection tools are available. Publishers are working on their own tools. So be transparent, disclose everything. It's in the best interest for everyone. So finally, remember, as an author, you are accountable and responsible for everything. If you misrepresent information or do not reference accurately and precisely, even by negligence, it's considered scientific misconduct. ChatGPT makes stuff up, even the paid version. And fact checking takes a lot of time, so allow time for that if you're going to use the tool. The content it produces is shallow. It has does not, it's not original, it has no insight, and you must be or become the expert. Text will still require editing. It does not produce ready to print prose and take careful notes and disclose, disclose, disclose when you're publishing. So doing the writing yourself has value actually. Writing is hard and it should be because you're learning your subject matter. You're becoming the expert as you write. So I advise you to avoid taking too many shortcuts. Um, and finally, remember that you're sharing information with an opaque for-profit company. Can you be absolutely certain of their ethics? What are they going to do with your inputs, feedbacks, and comments? Right? ChatGPT is here to stay. So let's be informed, intelligent, and cautious users of the technology. Let's lead it and not be led by it. So here's a list of resources for the authorship guidelines that I mentioned earlier that you can look up. And so that's it for me for ChatGPT. I invite you to join us for our next coffee lecture in the series. And I'm happy to answer any of your questions and I welcome your comments. Please feel free to share your experiences uh, with ChatGPT. Um, and also please feel free to reach out to me later by email if you want. Thank you so much.